Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here in the Sabbath School class of Camelback, the one we call Focal Point. And we've been getting into some of our fundamental beliefs and um, as a church, and I've just been enjoying every step of the way, kind of with you. And I don't know how long this, this goes. You know, it goes until we're, we're done, I guess, as they say. But uh, you're never really done learning, right? And so we'll always be learning. But um, today's topic, along with probably a couple more uh, studies on the same topic, is a very important one to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, it is, a, it is the, the foundational kind of a key to understanding our role as a church and our mission as Seventh-day Adventists. And so you'll see some of that, not so much coming out this week, but next week. And then um, I think the first Sabbath, no, maybe the second Sabbath of the new year, then we'll pick it back up again. But, uh, but I'm looking forward to this time that we have together today and just want to thank you for, for being here. Let's get started with prayer as we always do. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we have together. I pray for your blessing upon our class today. Uh, open our hearts to hear your voice. May you guide us through your word. And may we allow it to enrich our lives and apply it personally in, in, uh, in our lives as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, it is, again, I say it's a blessing to have you all here. And this isn't a hold your questions to the end. If you've got something you want to say, you can raise your hand and, and pop in there at any time. But it's really part one of the Heavenly Sanctuary message, uh, the, the truth that we have as a church. And so we're going to start off with some kind of some basic things, but some very important things that establish the foundation for what the Bible is telling us in relation to uh, God's work in heaven in our behalf, even right now. The Bible is full of symbolism. Does everybody know what I mean by symbolism? Um, what is a symbol? Okay, something that represents something else. So it's not the real, it's, it's, it's pointing to something else, right? Okay, um, the Bible is full of them. Uh, they point to important future realities. So they aren't the real, but they point to something that is real. And you'll see that consistently through Scripture. Not only do we derive that from what we see reading Scripture, but what you'll find is that even the Bible writers themselves in the New Testament frequently look back, pulled from symbols from the Old Testament, and applied them to their teaching. So this is a method that even the authors of Scripture used Symbols of the old pointing to realities of the future, and those realities culminate in who, first and foremost? Jesus, okay? All right, but they can symbolize, symbols can symbolize people, things, or events as well, and so we'll get into some of that, but mostly we are focused on who it points to first and foremost, and that is Jesus. We find that uh, John, who was uh, the baptizer, John the Baptist, was walking around and he put he, he was looking across to Jesus and he said some very profound words. He said these words and looking to Jesus as he walked, he said what? Behold the Lamb of God. Now, most Christians understand that Jesus was the Lamb sent from God to save people from their sins, right? That's an important concept. And so we find that here John immediately recognizing the role of Jesus and who he is. Now, if you, were a, if you were a Jewish leader, teacher, even one that just followed any of the teachings of the Jews during this time, when you so heard the word lamb, what were you thinking about? Sacrifices. Sacrifices, right? Specifically the sacrifice of a lamb as an offering. That was kind of like, that's the highest offering that we find um, with great meaning throughout the Old Testament. And so John himself uses the symbol of the lamb and points to Jesus. And instead of saying, That's, this is Jesus, he says, no, this is the lamb of God. We find that throughout the Old Testament, even way long before this, the system that was given to the Israelites as a nation was instituted at Sinai, that these altars were raised, sacrifices were made, and they all pointed to who? 
to Jesus, the Lamb of God. He was the Messiah who would become the Savior of the world. But then we find we get to the point where the Exodus happens. The Israelites were in Egypt, it says 400 years. And, uh, and I'm giving that as a rough number. There's uh, several numbers in Scripture, 400, 430, and some others that can be reconciled. I wish we had some time to get into that. If you had any questions on it, let me know, and I can give you some more detail. But uh, we find that the Israelites are in Egypt, and they've been slaves for a very long time. And Jesus, it says that God heard their cries for deliverance, and he delivered them in this uh, exodus. And when he finally gets them to Mount Sinai, he says these very interesting words. He says to Moses on the mountain, when he met Moses on the mountain, he said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may do what? I may dwell among them. You have to imagine that these words were very comforting because what had the Israelites just been through in slavery for 400 years? Do you think they felt like God was with them? No, in fact, to many degrees, they thought that God had forsaken them, right? And so here God delivers them by a mighty hand. He brings them to the base of Mount Sinai. He meets with Moses and he tells Moses, let them, that is the people, make me a sanctuary. And the purpose for that is to do what? To dwell with them. What does it mean to dwell? He wanted to live among them, right? He wanted to live there with them. In fact, this picture is one picture that I have of uh, the sanctuary. You can see that uh, uh, this tabernacle, which was portable, is, is built uh, according to what God's design was given to Moses. And it was put at the very center of the encampment. You find the tents out here. That encampment surrounded the entire sanctuary and the tabernacle, the whole system. And it, so that these tents go for miles out. And at the center, at the core of their system, their belief, their way of life was this sanctuary. And who was there? God was there. God officially institutes a sacrificial system that was after the same pattern of the former sacrifices that were made that all pointed to Jesus. And um, this was after many, many years, of course, of being in slavery. So who was the architect of the sanctuary? We have to ask ourselves. So who, who made this sanctuary, or at least designed this sanctuary? Well, let's see what the scripture has to say about that. It says in Exodus 25, 9, according to all that I show you, God tells Moses, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall do what? Make it. So in other words, I'm going to show you everything that you should do exactly to specification and you should make it after the, what is the word he uses? The pattern. Okay. How many of you, um, how many of you have done some sewing before? Okay. There's some few sewers out there. Um, how important are patterns? If you want the dress or the garment to look like you see it in the picture, <laughs> very important. If you don't have the pattern, chances are it's not going to look exactly like uh, you want it to look. At least it looks on the picture. And so God is telling them very clearly that I have a pattern. It's already set up. Just follow the pattern, not only for the tabernacle, but all its furnish furnishings. It says in Hebrews 8, 5, this is the bridge now. I just want to mention briefly, you're going to see a lot of passages from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And that is because... Hebrews bridges the Old Testament system under the Old Covenant historical system with the new under Christ. And so you repeatedly see references back from Hebrews to what was happening in the Old Testament. And, he, and here the Old Testament writer of Hebrews, I believe it's Paul the Apostle, as many others do. Some do not, that's okay. But it says here, uh, he says, for uh, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain, a direct reference to the Old Testament passage about that, making it after the pattern. So what did God mean by pattern? Now, this is an important thing to, to talk about because uh, there are divergent opinions out there in, in regard to 
what pattern means in the New Testament. Uh, and part of those divergent opinions, I think, are established, or at least they've come about, by a different reading of Scripture than what historically we have understood as to how to read Scripture. Some of the higher critical methods, some other things, some allegorical approaches, all these things have influenced a different idea and ideas of what some of these words mean. But we take words literally unless they're clear, clear symbolic. Uh, there's clear symbolism, right? That's kind of how scripture has been studied and read over time throughout history. And we continue that tradition as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. So a pattern comes from an original. We talked about that here. It's something that represents or that shows you what, uh, how something should be built or made. Pattern is a translation of the word typos in Greek. Okay, I'm going to give you a Greek word here so you can understand this because this is what the writers are using. The writers use the word typos when speaking of pattern. And it goes on to say here, authors of the New Testament employed the word pattern or even the word type to describe what they were interpreting from the Old Testament. It's the bridging of type and antitype. So if it, it says here that the type is not necessarily the, the real, but it's a representation of the real, right? So the pattern that was given or shown to Moses wasn't the real sanctuary. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It was a picture of what it should look like that he would then take and have the Israelites build. It says... Uh, the Old Testament writers there have left no doubt to their intentions for using typology. Writers even labeled it as such. When they use the word typos, they're saying there's typology in the scriptures. There's this that comes, that points to, that is a fulfillment of a representation or a symbol of the Old Testament. Now, before we go any further, I want to just make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. So when you have a type, a representation or a symbol from the past, the Old Testament, in the New Testament, here's another word for you, you have anti-type. So antitype is actually the real. Type is just the symbol of the representation. Or you could just words, use the words symbol, real. That's type, antitype. It goes on. The elements of biblical typology indicate that Old Testament types find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. Christ is not a second path of salvation, but the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan to save all mankind instituted in symbols after the fall. So Adam and Eve fell into sin and immediately, instead of dying, according to the law, which said they would die if they were to sin, God stepped in and he began to look for them. Remember the first question God asked Adam and Eve after the fall? Where are you? And so he's looking for them and he asked them to come near and they said, well, we, we felt we were naked and we hid. Well, who told you this? And so what he's trying to do is he's, he's trying to engage in this teaching moment that, uh, that is showing them that although the law requires death of those that transgress it, um, that God will make a way. And you find immediately that God gives them what to wear. He gives them clothes made out of skins, animal skins, which reveal that there was a sacrifice or some kind of um, death of an animal that allowed them to then be covered again. Another high form of symbolism here. Jesus provides us with our covering. And then throughout the Old Testament, we find this. And the New Testament writers are saying, ooh, let me take that, I'll restate it, and I'll tell you what it means. And they do that repeatedly over and over again through typology. You know, it's kind of a big theological word, but that's, that's very clear what they're doing. They're being very intentional in this. Now, here's something really I, I loved uh, it when I found, and I found it and I heard it. Um, someone pointed it to me. It's from the story of redemption, the book, page 251, Ellen White says this here, God presented before Moses a miniature model of the heavenly sanctuary and commanded him to make all things according to the pattern show him, shown him in the mount. A miniature model. That model was the type. 
Uh, anybody ever um, dabble in, you know, making models, um, planes, cars? How about architecture? Um, most of you know that when an architect starts to build or design a, uh, a building and they meet with uh, people that want that building made and they create plans, they usually create some kind of a model so they could bring it and show the people what it will look like when it's finished. This is what Jesus, God, was doing at the time. Uh, the pre-incarnate Christ, God, was doing. He's saying, here is the miniature model. Here's what the tabernacle should look like. And Moses, you're to go down and have the people make it so that I can dwell with them. So it says in Hebrews 9, verse 1, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. And we'll look at these in more detail here in just a minute. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was the golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. So a quick kind of a... Um, uh, a picture of the furnishings that are in these two apartments of the sanctuary. And so here's a, here's a representation of that. So what he's describing is he's describing that as you come into the tabernacle itself, you have a lampstand, you have a table of showbread on this side, so the lampstand will be on your left, table of showbread on your right, straight ahead of you is the altar of incense with the veil that is there between the holy and the most holy. And in the most holy, you have what? You have the Ark of the Covenant. Now, it's interesting that the writer, the, the, um, uh, Paul, uh, who I believe, of course, wrote, wrote Hebrews, is mentioning the incense, the altar of incense, in conjunction with the most holy place. And I think one of the reasons he does that is because he's talking about function more than placement or location. Uh, if you look through the passage, you can clearly tell that there's more things there about the function of what these things are, not necessarily exactly how they're placed. But you can see that the altar of incense is placed up right against the veil, and the incense that ascends from this is designed to go up and over the veil into the Most Holy. So its function was to serve as part of the Most Holy work, where God was continually dwelling. So let's take a closer look at the sanctuary and these items of furniture. Um, first of all, we've already noticed that there's two apartments, right? You could say compartments or apartments. What's the first one? The holy place. The second is most holy place. Now, some would say, boy, this is all a bunch of Old Testament stuff. Actually, we just read New Testament. It's not Old Testament stuff. This is stuff that is helping us, the New Testament writers are saying, this is what all those things meant. And Jesus fulfilled them all. And now we're going to get into how he did that through these articles of furniture. Uh, Gloria, let's get another chair here. Um, Matthew, can you grab a chair from, from back here? And maybe you can bring it back for, for Gloria. Oh, there, she can sit there. I just don't want you to have to stand. <laughs> all right. So let's take a close at each of these articles of, or, or furniture and the realities that are there behind them. They all come alive in Christ who is the fulfillment of them. Let's look at John 10, verses 1 and 2. Most assuredly I say to you, and this is Jesus speaking, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, cryptic language almost there, isn't it? But what he's talking about here is there's a front, there's an entrance to the sanctuary services that comes through the front gate there or door of the courtyard. And what he's saying is that he is the only 
one as the shepherd that can bring us into or toward the presence of God. Remember, the sanctuary services were designed to, to reveal realities, future realities. And it overlays the plan of salvation from beginning to end, because we saw them at the beginning, right after the fall of man, and we're gonna see them culminated at the very end. But one of those realities is that when you come to know Jesus, he brings you closer and closer each step to the Father. You come into the courtyard, you go a little further through baptism, you go into the holy place, and you start experiencing what's there. And then in the last culmination, the last final piece, there's this day of atonement language where you are acquitted as the judgment is finished and Christ comes to take him, take you as, as his own to heaven. So there's this progression closer and closer going into the presence of God, which dwelled in the most holy place. So he's saying, if you come in by any other way, you're a what? Thief and a robber. So some might say, um, well, there's lots of ways to heaven. But Jesus doesn't say that, does he? Jesus says, what did he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Notice the direction. No one comes to the Father, can get close to the Father, can dwell with him, and accept through me. So uh, is it rigid to say Jesus is the only way, or is it simply the truth? It is simply the truth. That's all it is. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, first um, item or, or piece of furniture that's in the courtyard. If you were an Israelite and sin had occurred in your family or even, among, even within yourself, you would as a head of household or you would um, as, a, um, as a person called to, to bring an offering to the Lord would take a lamb or if there wasn't a lamb, there are other different kinds of offerings that you can make according to your ability to pay and the wealth that you had. But a lamb, let's just use the lamb because we're keeping with that symbol. Um, you would bring that lamb to the courtyard and you would, you would be met by a priest as you came into the, the door of that outer courtyard. And the priest would um, kneel down or have you kneel down right there by the lamb. And you would place your hands over the head of the lamb and you would confess your sin and the sin that had occurred in your family over that lamb. And then the, 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 it would symbolize the transference of sin from you to the lamb. And then what happened to the lamb? The, the priest would give you the knife and you would cut the lamb's throat and the blood would spill out into a bowl and the lamb would, of course, collapse, the, gave, gave up its life and that bowl, the blood will be sprinkled on uh, around the, the altar here and also be spread onto the four horns on the corner of that altar. Now, what does this symbolize? We can just, we can almost do a little bit of guessing here, right? Um, just based on your past experience and knowledge. When, what is happening with the man confessing sin over the lamb? What does that symbolize? Okay confessing to Christ our sin and transferring our sin to him who has done what? Paid the price for it already by his death on the cross. So like the earlier picture that, uh, that was there, that we saw the altar and Christ had the cross of Christ above that, this altar symbolizes Christ and his cross. And where did the cross, where did the crucifixion take place? In heaven or on earth? earth? On earth. So the courtyard is actually a symbol of what takes place on the earth. So as you come in and you confess and your sins are placed on the animal and the animal gives up its life, it's a representation of Christ, what he did for us while he was on this earth and giving up his life as a ransom for, for all. It says in Revelation 5, 6, and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. This verse takes place at the inauguration or the ceremony to inaugurate the most, uh, the, the temple or the sanctuary in heaven before Christ began his ministry as high priest. 
I'm kind of getting ahead a little bit there, but I want to give you a little piece of information here as to where this is coming from. So what John is seeing is during this coronation of Christ as high priest, who's going to serve as a minister in the heavenly temple, he sees that he had been what? Slain. So the amazing thing here that we pick up from this is courtyard, cross, represented by this brazen altar, and at Christ's resurrection and then ascension to heaven, coronation takes place where then he steps in as high priest to serve as a minister of the temple in heaven. And we'll see some verses here about that temple and what is going on there as we continue our study. So it goes from the courtyard right into heaven. And so the earthly temple with its courtyard is pointing to that ministry that Christ would then do. Not just sacrifice his life on this earth, but ascend to heaven and begin to minister in our behalf. All right, so here's the laver. The laver stood between the tabernacle door and the altar of burnt offering. So the, the burnt offering of the altar is first, and then just beyond that is this laver that is between the door and um, the altar burnt offering. And the priests would wash their hands before entering the temple, but they would also wash their hands before they took a sacrifice from somebody. And of course, the washing of hands is to, any washing in scripture is symbolizing what? Cleansing, right? You're cleansed, you're, you're, you're getting rid of something that's dirty. And so God is very clear. I want you to make sure that you're clean in your ministry before me. And so all the priests, the common priest and the high priest would always wash and make sure that their hands were clean. It says in Titus 3, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he did what? He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the spirit. So that adds another element to the labor. God just doesn't wash us clean and leave us there. What does he then do? He fills us with his spirit and with power and strength. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that parable that Jesus gave about uh, the person who had, um, it was a symbol of kind of this, this incredible uh, uh, decision that a gentleman made to clean out all the old junk out of his life and he just got rid of everything he possibly could that he knew that was standing before him and God and the room was completely clean and it was empty and the room symbolized his heart and his mind and then we find this old devil coming back and he wants to peek in the room and he says what nothing's there in other words God's spirit isn't even there and what, is it, what happens as a result of that? It says that he goes and gets his friends and seven times more demons come into that room and fill this person's life, essentially. So it's not enough to just be cleansed or forgiven and being baptized. You want to be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when the devil comes looking, if he sees the Holy Spirit, he says what? Uh, can't go in there. <laughs> I'll look for somebody else. And so we want to be filled and renewed, regenerated, it says here, by the Holy Spirit. And so that's the symbol of the labor and the, the washing that occurs there. And what Christ does for us, he not only forgave us, but he cleanses us and washes us and makes us clean and fills us with his spirit. Now, another aspect of cleanse that maybe we haven't talked about uh, before, and maybe, I don't know if you've thought about this before, is forgiveness and cleansing are, are, are terms that appear together in the New Testament. 1 John 1, 9 is one that I can think of, right? If, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see altar there, a burnt offering, and you see the laver in that passage. So one of the things you hear or you see by, understand by cleansing is, uh, this gets a little bit deep maybe into the workings of our brain and so forth, but um, when you repeat a behavior and you do it enough, it becomes what? A, a habit. Those habits actually form super highways in your brain that cause it to be a habit. In other words, when you repeat a behavior, that, 
that axiom, they call it, that connects one to the next, it becomes wider and wider. At first it's a, it's a path, and then it's a dirt road, and then it's paved, and then it's a super highway. Uh, addictions are super highways. Cleansing cuts those things. If you wonder why, boy, how in the world did I go from wanting that, now I have no desire to do that anymore. Well, the Holy Spirit stepped in and he did what? Cut that super highway off. And you can reform it. You can, on your own will, go back into that again if you so choose. But he has delivered you. And I don't know why anybody would want to go into those things. I'll tell you, I gave up drinking, drug use, all that stuff when I accepted Christ and just found no interest from then till now to ever go back. But he cut that, those highways and cleansed me, my path. He not only forgave me, he cleansed my path and enabled me to have a chance. So if you're struggling with something, to be clean of something, cleanse your room out, clean it out, but then let the Holy Spirit fill you and ask him to cut those things that bind you, that hold you back, and he will do it. He absolutely will do it. Jesus says in John 3, 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of what? Water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, more to this probably than we realize, it's not just cannot enter the kingdom of God in a future reality, but even by faith, even by faith that you put in Christ, you are entering or you are submitting yourself to benefit from the work that Jesus is doing for you in the heavenly sanctuary. Did you know that? By faith, he represents you to his Father in the heavenly sanctuary. Not to appease the Father. The Father loves you as much as Jesus loves you. But they both acknowledge, as Jesus says, you know, Elizabeth is mine. And God says, yes, I know. And then you are received and accepted and, and loved. As you've always been loved, but to a greater degree, because now you are following um, in the ways that they have chosen, the path that they have chosen for you. Okay. Let's go to the next one here, the, uh, the lampstand or the candlestick, as some would say. It says in John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So again, the altar symbolized Christ on the cross, the laver, the cleansing power and the, the washing that we receive from him and the infilling of his spirit. And then now we find as we go into the, the first apartment of the sanctuary to the left in this candlestick or lampstand, we find that Jesus is represented as a light of the world. And it's interesting too, if you find in um, Revelation chapter one, Jesus is walking amidst the candlesticks the seven candlesticks, or the seven lampstands, actually, in most translations. And those lampstands represent the seven churches. So a clear connection there that Christ is the light of the world, but he shines that light through who? Through his church. And he has done that through the ages, over the ages since his um, ascension into heaven after the resurrection. Okay. Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. So as an example of what he wants to do with us, it says that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And what did he do as a result of that anointing? He went about doing good. So what does Jesus want us when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and anointed by him? For, his, for ministry, for work in his kingdom. He wants us to go about doing good, healing people around us. And believe me, all of us, we, never, we may not be supernatural healers, but let me tell you what healing comes from a kind word that said so, to somebody. You know, just a, just a thought of, or an act of kindness is a healing process that can occur in somebody's life because you have been kind or or um, even shared a kind word with someone. And so uh, even at the, the most elementary level, we can be light that shines to the world through our deeds and our words.
Okay, and so to the right, as you come into the sanctuary, you'll look to the right there and you'll see this table. And on that table, you have what is called the showbread. It says in the Old Testament, the showbread, which are loaves of bread, two stacks uh, of loaves of bread that are seated on a gold covered article of furniture. And it says here in John six, I am the bread of life, Jesus says. So not only is he alive of the world, he's the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. So in other words, as you look back at your ancestors, he said, they ate manna and they're dead. Um, but if you eat from me, you will never die. So we need to be eating from the bread of life, which is partaking of the life of Christ. He goes on to say, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Okay, so that's again, another representation of, of Jesus. Looking straight ahead then, as you continue on into deeper into the heavenly sanctuary in that first apartment, we come up to the altar of incense. And again, New Testament writers referring to the articles of furniture from the old covenant system uh, is saying these words. This is coming from, and this is actually from an angel that appears to John in Revelation 8. It says, the, another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the what? The prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Remember I said that the altar, I mean the, the altar of incense serves as function with the most holy place. That's why the throne is referred to as the, the God's glory, which resides right above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. So these two serve functionally, not in the same way, but they, they work together in conjunction with each other. And so we find that these are the prayers of the saints mixed with um, the incense. Why would our prayers need to be mixed with incense before ascending to God? Do you have of your own accord any right, or maybe the right's not even the, the right word, do you have anything that commends you to God, that you can offer God of yourself? Everything is about Jesus. He covers you. He's paid the price. He's forgiven you. He's so the smoke that ascends up, which smells sweet and good, is ascending up with the prayers of the saints. What does that smoke represent? Jesus and his righteousness. So the prayers, our prayers, have a righteous element in Christ as it ascends up before, before God. He finishes in verse 4 by saying, in the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascend before God from the angel's hand. Okay, then you have this veil that is in between the holy place and the most holy place. And we find that uh, it has some deep symbolism here that is found in scripture, especially the story of the crucifixion. And in the Gospel of Mark, it says in chapter 15, verse 37, that Jesus cried out with a loud voice as he was hanging there on the cross toward the very end. And he did what? He breathed his last. And as he breathed his last, what happened to the veil? The veil was torn in two from bottom to top. Isn't that how you tear a, a thing from the bottom if you're standing down below? No, this one is torn from top to bottom. Who's tearing this veil? God is tearing this veil, right? And what he's saying is, the sacrifice has been made, it is finished, and this sacrificial system on the earth is done. It's over. There's no need for an earthly temple. And um, you can have full access to God, to me as Father, through Christ and his sacrifice. Uh, it says in Hebrews, same, same kind of, of language. Uh, chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way 
that he opened for us through the curtain. That is through his what? Flesh. Curtain represents the flesh of Christ, which he said, his body, given for us. Back to Mark chapter 15. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So that it is finished was a declaration of the end of the old covenantal sacrificial, ceremonial sacrificial system that had existed for at least 2,000 years. And then long before that, in a, in a less organized, fully implemented way before Sinai. So you see where everything was pointing to? Everything's pointing to Jesus, but most importantly, everything's pointing to Jesus, whose work really, who gives us access to his Father through his death on the cross, and then makes a way all the way into the holy place by the various things that he does in ministry in our behalf. It's a new and living way. Hebrews 8.13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first one what? Obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So Paul is saying here, as he continues his commentary to connect old typology with the, the real, the realities of Christ, he's saying that old system has become obsolete. Why did it become obsolete? Because Jesus has fulfilled the things that they pointed to. That's what type meeting anatype does. Anatype, or the real, wipes out the type, the need for any old or any symbol, because it no longer exists. So here's one, I'll throw something else out there really quick. So in the New Testament, sometimes there's this language that appears to be implying that the law was done away with, gone. Um, there's only an, there's an aspect of the law that was done away with, that has become obsolete, and that aspect is what Christ has fulfilled. In other words, he is, the, the things that pointed to him are gone, so he now is the reality. The Ten Commandments are never referred to as types. The Ten Commandments are always referred to as an eternal decalogue, an eternal standard, a foundation of the throne. And so you'll find that here in the Ark of the Covenant, which exists where? In the most holy place. So while the old system has become obsolete, the type is showing you that the Ark of the Covenant, which includes the law of God within it, has at its foundation or at its core an eternal existence. And so we'll read that here in just a, a minute. Uh, Exodus 25, verse 21. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the Ark, and in the Ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. That testimony, this here, capital T, those are the Ten Commandments, often referred to as the table of the testimony or the tables of the testimony. Same, same, different language, same thing that it's referring to. And he goes on to say, and I will speak with you, saying to Moses, I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So where did God's presence reside in this movable temple of the Old Testament? Especially in the wilderness, right? Where, where was God's presence? Above the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. So the presence of God is just right here. And that's where he, he resided. And he would speak to the people, and that's where he would give them direction. He would guide them with his love and care and counsel, and he would meet with them there. In fact, sometimes you heard, you'll, you'll read about the high priest going in to the temple, and he would wear this vest and the umum and thummim, and it would give them yeses or noes and things. This is God communicating with his people on a regular basis, dwelling in their midst. Here's the amazing thing about that. Today we live at a time where Christ has fulfilled that all and he can speak to your heart and mind at a moment through his spirit to help guide and direct you throughout your life. You don't have to go into a temple and rely on a priest because Jesus is your high priest. Talk to him, he'll help you. And that's the beauty of this whole system and what it was really pointing to. 
Uh, let's see, Matthew 9, 12, Jesus said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means, for I desire mercy and not what? And not sacrifice. Mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The reason why God's presence resided above the mercy seat was because mercy covered the Ten Commandment law, which brought death. Because if you're a sinner and you look at this law and you see you don't measure up, what is the result? What is, your, what is the consequence? D death, because you don't measure up to God's law, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. I mean, how many times does the New Testament, the Old Testament even talk about sin and what it does, its effects? But here, God in his mercy covers that and resides above the mercy seat. And he says that I call you now. I call you to me, not just because the sac for sacrifice's sake. The true meaning is that I desire mercy and I want a relationship with you. I want to reconcile with you and be merciful to you. His, ob his objective, Christ's objective is always to save. Remember he says, I came to save, not to condemn. I came to save. If you won't receive, I, Old Testament, I, there's so much in here I could have put, but Old Testament language, uh, God appealing to his people, why won't you turn and live? Why do you insist on dying, on holding on to the things of this earth that mean nothing? Turn to me, live, I will give you life. And that's his objective as he dwells there um, before his father even today in the heavenly sanctuary. So Jesus is, let's talk about the ministry of Jesus as our high priest. So I had already mentioned before that in the outer courtyard, the courtyard represents what? Where is that taking place? On, earth. On the earth. Then at Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven, there was an inauguration that took place, a ceremony that took place that inaugurated the heavenly temple. And he then began his work as high priest for us in the heavenly temple. So the sins we confess, he still has paid for, but he has paid for them and continues to mediate for us by his own blood so that we are seen just as we have never sinned. So that is what's going on on a constant daily basis. The next time we meet, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this and, and the implications of this. But we, I've just given you a little bit of an example here beforehand because it's important. But the courtyard takes place to represent things that take place on the earth, and then the tabernacle or sanctuary or temple or tent, all the same thing referring to this building, refers to a heavenly temple. And notice this here, this language from Hebrews chapter nine. This is very key. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary has not yet been disclosed as long as the first tent is still standing. So the Holy Spirit is telling us that the way into the sanctuary has not been disclosed as long as the first tent or temple, the tabernacle here on this earth, is still doing what? Standing. So while it's still functional, it's still going, before Christ appeared to fulfill all those things, there's no way into the actual sanctuary, which you'll see here very soon resides in heaven. He goes on, this is a symbol of the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience, con conscience of the worshiper. So someone worshiping comes and offers a lamb and things happen and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, of course they're clean in symbol, they're clean, but they're not actually clean until who cleans them up? Jesus, but he hasn't come yet. So, Janet. Okay, all right. What time are we at? 10.26? We're right at the end. We're right at the end. Okay. So that's what it's saying. Look at the next uh, verse here. Verse 10. They deal only with food and drink and various baptisms, regulations for the body imposed until the time comes to do what? Set things right. And some of this language will come alive in our next meeting together. The setting right of the sanctuary. He goes on. But when Christ appeared, this is verse 11, as high priest of the good things that have come, 
then through the greater and more perfect tent. Where would the greater and more perfect tent or tabernacle be? Up there, not made with hands that is not of this creation. Pointing clearly to a, a temple that is, the, that is the one that is the, the reality, not the copy. He entered once and for all into the holy places, that is the whole sanctuary, both, um, uh, both first apartment and second apartment for this inauguration ceremony that took place. He entered both, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption for us. All right, this is the last slide, so I think we're going to do it, Janet. All right, verse 24, same, same chapter. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God in our behalf. There is no doubt, the writer of Hebrews is leaving no doubt that all the types and symbols are fulfilled in Christ, Christ's great sacrifice on earth as prefigured by the altar of burnt offering and the labor which he has, is given to us, but then he now mediates for us in a temple that doesn't reside here, but resides in heavenly, heavenly, um, in the heavenly realm and that God made and not man. Okay, any questions, which we have probably some moments for a few. Yes. Praise the Lord, right? It's, yeah, fantastic. Uh, I, I'm trying to make it simple because sometimes we make it so complicated, but I'm trying to make this fairly simple. We're going to take bites at a time to go through this, but this is just so important. The next time we meet, we're going to dive deeper into the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. So now, so we've already got him there, right? So what is he doing there, and why does it matter to us today what he's doing? And so that's what we're going to go to next Sabbath. So I, I hope and pray that you come back and we can spend some more time together because you can't do justice in just one, one sitting. Any other questions or thoughts? All right, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love and grace and for Jesus who not only paid the ultimate price with giving up his own life on the cross, but Lord, he fulfilled all those things that were pointing to him from the Old Testament and that are realities today. And by faith, we now have access to you, our Father, in the heavenly realm through his ministry for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Father, what a beautiful picture. And we pray, Lord, that day by day, we can come before you with our prayers of confession and, and praise and thanksgiving and have that constant interaction with you as you pour your spirit on us and we give up to you our lives and by faith, stay connected with you. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.